Our next speaker is originally from Southern Indiana and played at the University of Evansville. He is currently the Director of Junior Development at Countryside Country Club and he's the head boys and girls tennis coach for Calvary High School in Clearwater, Florida. He's a USPTA Tampa, Florida president and he serves on the USPTA National Committee for U30, Adaptive Tennis and Marketing. I'd like you to welcome Mike Waugh. still lives in southern Indiana and it's had a 600 people with no stoplights. Um, if you guys know Indiana, it's all foreign basketball and then basketball players play tennis, so there's some good players every once in a while. Um, but thank you guys for bringing mine. Thank you and thank you guys for everything. Um, I'm going to kind of leave it loose, so if you have any questions, feel free to blur it out. We'll try to answer it. Uh, today we're going to six F fantastic. So when I'm going over this and I, I run through a couple of my friends, they're like, are you sure you want a title of this? I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it clean. Um, but you can always add a couple S's if you want to. Uh, so the first one is focus. You have to have your practices have a focus. Whether if you have it on a sheet, um, there's always going to be detractors, especially if you're dealing with uh, high school teams. They're going to be tracking from your practice. There's always going to be those guys that are the class clown that want to act up and, and do whatever they want to do or ask 15 questions. So you got to make sure that you're keeping your focus when you're doing your practices. Um, if you have a set goal for the day, whether if it's cross courts, down the lines, ground strokes, um, pro shots, whatever your focus is for the day, make sure that you always keep going back to that. As you're, as you're bringing everything full circle. So if you have an hour and a half long practice, make sure you refer to that back every 15, 20 minutes that this is what our focus is and try to keep everybody on task. Um, you want to be able to keep players busy because if they don't get busy, I found that they lose focus and they don't remember what the drill is. Um, so if you're coaching, uh, like when, when I coached in Evansville, we ran on three courts and had 20 players on three courts. And now that I'm coaching in Florida, I have a club with 14 courts, and oftentimes I've got to have sometimes 10 players on the courts because the members take presence. So I'll have 13 courts of member play and one court that I can run juniors on. So even though we have a larger facility, it may not be best situation. So you want to make sure that everyone has a focus and everyone is staying on task. Uh, next is factual. Uh, this is one of the bigger ones I pick because at every club I've been to, I always watch the other pros teach and sometimes the information given may not be the best information. Uh, I've had one coach that was on the court next to me telling a 4-0 player to hit their serve under it like this. I had another, the same coach actually, told their players to keep their elbow in. Now, I think that's more stylistic. I don't teach style. I teach fundamentals. I teach, I teach parameters, what may work best for them. But keeping your elbow in or hitting underneath the bottom of the serve, I think that's a pretty big thing that you just don't do anymore. Um, so I want to make sure that everything's factual. Um, every coach has their own language. So if you're working with a player, and say this player has been with three or four other coaches, what you may be saying to them could be different. It could be the first time they've ever heard it. So you want to make sure that when you're communicating with another player, or with the player for the first time, they learn your verbiage. They learn what you're trying to say. They learn that you're trying to help them out. So what they may have heard before may be the same thing, but it's being said in a different way. Um, you can never go wrong with the kinetic chain, physics, and biomechanics. So if you stick and if you study the kinetic chain and, and how a player works, so if you, you have a player and they're not utilizing, like they're on the surf from the ground up, and they're doing all this, and they're, and they're not getting the, the hip and leg action on that, 
Well, then that's a good place to start. It's using that kinetic chain will be very factual and then help them out uh, in their development. And these things, they go from 10 and under, they go from high school players, I think which is very big high school players because that's going to be the majority of players that are going to be playing leagues because all leagues can't be 4, 5 and above. We need the 3 O's, we need the 2 5's, we need the 3 5's, we need those players to help generate income for us later on. And if you start them off in the high school area and you get them to love tennis, then you're going to have a larger base for everyone to grow off of. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, the next thing, I think we need to go a little fast here. So if you guys have any questions, be sure you can speak up, please. Uh, is fundamentals. So we have our six uh, fundamentals here of physical, technical, tactical, strategic, mental, and environmental. We want to be sure we're hitting on those so whenever we do a lesson plan that say I'm going to be out of town for the next week. Say I go to the TTC and I have to have somebody fill in for my lessons. I want my lesson plan that I give to my assistant pro to show what some of these things are. So if they have a parent come up to them, because you have a lot of times, if you have a kid that trusts you, they'll run through a wall. But it's the parent that's gonna be questioning why you're doing this, why you're doing this, why you're doing this. The kids are gonna question. Um, sometimes you have a kid question, and oftentimes it's why. So if you can show on there, on your lesson plans, so this drill does technical, we're doing this, to tactically do this, it works hand in hand. If that's written out on paper, then that's going to be clearer for your assistants to help you out as well. Um, on the serve, uh, I'm not going to go over some of these, but on the fundamentals, you want to make sure that there's a good base. Because when we get into a tight situation, say you get to a third set tighter, and we don't have a good fundamental base, then they're going to suffer. They're going to revert back to what they're used to as far as, uh, say they have a, a slice second serve and they come to you and you've been working on for two months trying to kick the second serve in and it gets to be a third set tie break, they're going to go back to what's comfortable for them. So we want to make sure that each individual player is being taken care of. <coughs> Even though it's a, in a group situation, we want to coach them individually to their strengths. But we also want to make sure that they have a large fundamental base so we can grow exponentially on top of that. Um, the larger the base, the more you can put on what they're learning. Uh, this next part is I'm going to have whoever wants to do this with, with me. Um, not with me, but I'll have you guys do it. So, the fitness aspect. Uh, a lot of times, if you are, especially working in indoor courts, you have to really condense what you do indoors into a short period of time. So when I was coaching the doors, we would have our elite level players, and these are players that play Division I for an hour and a half, three days a week. And then they would come in and go like a evening session uh, for like an hour and a half, two hours late in the evening. So they didn't get a lot of court time. They're not, in Florida, we have programs that go three, four hours in a day, and they can spread out. Now, from what I've seen with those programs, some of them don't have the intensity. They don't have the drive. So you want to make sure that you can get into an hour and a half program, an hour and a half session, what you could, as much as what you can do. So when you involve fitness with this, especially when court time is limited, then it really gets to the players because tennis is so physical. Um, so the first thing here is to combine sprints, ladders, into drills. If you're familiar with cardio tennis, uh, do a lot of cardio tennis based drills. Uh, I'm not going to come out here and have you guys do a bunch of drills, but uh, I don't have the ladders out here either. But that's a good way to keep everything fast paced and moving. If you're not familiar, uh, go on to the Cardio Tennis Network and there's a lot of information on the page. It's well worth it um, to really get those fast paced drills, especially if you're limited on court space and you have six, eight players on a court, you can really get the movement through, 
hitting a lot of balls. Um, I do suggest if you actually are doing a cardio tennis course that you are using the lower compression balls. But if you're doing a practice and you're doing modified, then, then we can do that over here. Um, with the fitness, you want to make hitting the ball the easiest thing they do. Sometimes when players are playing, they get so wrapped up into what am I doing here? And they've got 15 things going through their head at one time, where it's just see the ball, hit the ball, and you see the, the biggest thing that they do. They forget that hitting the yellow fuzzy ball over the net is the main point of tennis. Uh, whether if it's serving, if it's ground strokes, if it's volleying. I had a player one time that came to me that wasn't very good at the net, and they were trying to hit their volleys, and they were just all over the place because they were like, I've got to turn here, I've got to step here, I've got to put my racket here. And it, when you're thinking, you're processing, you're processing, you're going to be slower, you're going to have those slower reaction times. And you really need to make hitting the ball the easiest thing that they do and let them just adapt to the situation. Um, the next thing is footwork. Um, can I get one player out here, please? Just one. Hey, get two, buddy. Is it me? Is it you? Yeah, I guess it is me. Okay. Somebody, thank you. So I do a lot of hand feeding. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of hand feeding. Uh, I do hand feeding because I can be from here to here with them, and I don't have to yell 78 feet away from them. Okay. Uh, it's also a little more personal. So we do a full. If I toss to his forehand, I'm going to toss with my left hand. If I toss to his backhand, I'm going to toss with my right hand. What I really try to do with my hand feeding is not cross myself. Okay, I, want to, I want to keep it on the outside here. Um, every once in a while, I make go ball behind my back just to catch him on the and make him work more. Okay, ready? You're going to forehand here. Does anyone have any questions on that? Can you walk through the difference between those two? Do you 
your feet are like this. You don't land out of his footstep like this. Okay? If you watch uh, receivers in the NFL when they line up, they got one foot up, one foot back, and then they push off and they go. They don't have to worry about that tall step because they're already there. If you watch spreaders, they've got one foot up, one foot back, they can go. When we're playing a sport, you may not necessarily know what you're doing, but if you can train your players to do this, to, to go from here and then go straight forward without taking that false step, that's going to help their, their efficiency. Especially if they're back there on the baseline. Somebody hits a short shot and they're not getting to the goal in time, well look at what their feet are doing back here. If they're taking that false step, two, three, and then they're going, they're spinning their wheels. They're not moving to the ball when they see it. So, you can take a step back, take a step forward. If any of you guys saw some dance on your floor too long, you're moving but you're not moving, kind of the same thing. So, right here guys, same thing, except try to be cognizant, try to be mindful of not taking that step back. Ready? Go. Oh! <laughs> Go ahead and do it again. Give me a Give me a quick here.
Fast. You've got to play fast. Uh, Irving Meyer says play with juice. I know he's a snare right now, but whatever. Or if you're in Michigan, you don't like Ohio State. Uh, but you've got to bring the juice. You've got to play fast. We want our players to enjoy the game. Um, I have on here that to get players to drill like they're in a line at Chick fil A. If you guys ever go to Chick fil A on the drive through, there could be 40, line, 40 cars in the line and you still get your food in five minutes. Okay? If you see that at Taco Bell, you're going to be waiting for an hour and a half. Okay? So, so, yeah. so you, you want to get players through. So it's one thing about, I know, no lines, but sometimes if you have a lot of players in a, in a combined space, you're going to have to have some lines. So one thing we do is in tennis, the average point lasts. Does anyone know how long the average point lasts in tennis? Three shots, 3.4 for females, 3.6 or 3.6, whatever, yeah, three shots. That's not a lot of time. Then how long is the in-between time for tennis? What's that? 25, hopefully not that long in juniors. Like, come on, let's go. You know, 15 seconds maybe. So we want to come up with a decent ratio of three to one um, at max. If you can beat the ratio of three seconds of rest to one second of hitting per drill, then you're doing good. So what I mean by that is, if you're resting for 15 seconds, then you should probably be hitting for five seconds or longer for each, for each drill or each part that you do. So if I have six players on the court, I want to make sure that those six players are doing something for the, major, for the majority of the time. So if I have 20 second time frame, and they're active for 10 seconds, and then they rest for 10 seconds, then I beat my ratio. Okay, we're getting more hours of time than just playing and getting lost. If they're on the court for 20 seconds, for every 20 seconds on the court, and they're resting, or they're playing for three, and they're resting for 17, I haven't beat my ratio. Is that? So we want to play fast, we want to have that intensity. Um, we want to have the energy. We want to, and as tennis providers and tennis coaches, we are the facilitator. So it's our responsibility that the energy level is high for that practice. We want to make sure that it's, it's up there. If we're not having a good practice, then we need to find out how we can bring the energy. A lot of times I'll bring out, here's a, I'll bring out a, a, a box and we'll play, music that's got a minimum BPM of 120 beats per minute. Okay? Get that music up there because then they start to feel it and they go, they roll with it. Then they, now they're, they got an actual bounce in their step and they're going with the energy on, from the music that sometimes they have a long day in school, they just spent seven, eight hours in the classroom, they took three finals and then now they gotta be on the court for an hour and a half or two hours or three hours depending on where you are. And a lot of times, if that energy drops, you gotta make sure it stays up at a high level at all times. Um, no waiting. Like I said, if I have eight players on the court, and I have them go through a six ball drill, and then they come back through around, they're, they're hitting six balls for every 48 fed. That's not beating my ratio. They've gotta make sure that they're getting through. So what I can do is, if I have eight players on a court, divide it up into lines of four, so two lines of four at, at least, and then that way their, their rest time instead of uh, six shots for every 48 balls, now six shots for every 24 balls. And now I'm getting close to that ratio that I may need. Is that okay? A lot of you guys already know this stuff, but it's maybe just a good reminder uh, to have. And then one of the Last oh so let's do this. Let me get uh, let me get as many players out here as I can. Let me get at least six. This is one. So one drill I like to do is so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six on this side. I've got two on that side. So what we're going to do is I'm going to be from here to you. If you win the point, you go over, and you have three seconds to get over. Okay. If you lose the point, you just rotate. Make sense? You guys, if you win the point, and give each other a high five and you switch sides. Okay? 
Okay? Hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully you can engage all of them and, and, and do a lot of drills there. Um, one more drill I want to do. Let me have uh, two over here and three over here, or six over here. You guys want to follow? Everywhere that I've gone, I've found that this drill is called something completely different. Um, where I'm from, we call it like Go Game. Uh, I've heard it called Rusty Crush. I'm actually standing on the wrong side of the net. So, I'll come over here. If you guys make three points, so ground stroke, probably overhead, take your spot. Okay? So, you guys, while you're not playing, we want you to do something active. Whether it is uh, right, uh, right here, or if you're pops, if you're shadow shooting, whatever you're doing, you have to be active. If you're standing still, you have to take a lap. And you lose your chance to play it. Make sense? Yes, right? That's good. So you're out, you're out, make it up. Uh, they have a fear of the ball. The ball is 
2.2 ounces yellow fuzzy in the field were there, and they have a rack in their hand. If they get hit with the ball, it's their own fault. I think that's the other thing, too, is we tend to like, oh, you hit him with the ball. No, they didn't hit the ball back. It was right to them. Why didn't they hit it with the rack? So we need to work on those things. Um, we need to maybe change the mindset. And we'll do a drill. I'll do a drill. I won't do it today. Um, uh, I'll have four or six players on the court, and it'll be volley to volley. And I'll stand in the service line, and I'll feed it in, no volley, volley, volley. If they lose, they're off. If they win, they stay in, and the next team will come in. And they're just running and hitting volleys, and it, it gets crazy. It's, it's fast. Um, everybody loves it. And then if they get hit, they get hit. No big deal. Rub some dirt on it and walk it off. It's going to Now, seriously, if they get cut, that's another thing. Like, then, then we'll like go inside, get a band aid, let's call your parents, you know. But, yeah. I was going to say, do you, uh, you use the green dot balls and the liquid pressure balls for sometimes for these, for the effect to get control before they start to get. I'll use orange balls. balls for my elite players. You don't get friction from that, yeah. They, if they, I use it as a training tool. Yeah, exactly. So, if they aren't comfortable with the net for whatever reason, Let's slow it down. Let's get it more comfortable. So if they get hit with the orange ball, they get hit with the orange ball. If they hit with the red ball, if they hit a red ball, let's go with the red ball. But if they're not comfortable with the net and playing the net, then they're losing half the court that they can play. So we build on them, we get them comfortable with the net, and then we move up. Then we go to, say we're at orange, then we go to green, then we go to green, then we go to yellow, and then now they're finding the ball in their strings and they're able to hit the volleys. I'm, I'm huge on serves because every point starts with the serve. If you can't get the ball in the box, then you can't start the point. Now you're, I mean, and let's be face it, tennis is about competition. I mean, the whole, it's a sport. We need to be able to compete. It's one thing that we have players that come out and they will take lesson after lesson after lesson for months on end, but they never do any competition. They need to compete. Tennis is a sport that's teaching competition. The first thing you do is you serve you serve the ball in the court. If they can't get the serve in, then they can't they can have the best ground strokes in the world, but they're not going to be able to show them off because they can't get the point started. Okay? The other thing too is volley. If they can't end the point at the net, it's like having a, like I said, having a basketball player that can't hit a layup. Okay, they may be great from mid-range, they may be great from the baseline, but if they can't finish in the net, then their value as an overall player, they don't have as many tools in the toolbox. It's like trying to build a birdhouse with only a screwdriver. And may not, it may not work, they don't have enough tools in their toolbox. Um, I think I said this before, you are the energy and you are the enthusiasm as, as the coach. And if you are having a horrible day, when you are on the court, nobody should be able to tell. If you have 15,000 things going wrong in your personal life, when you step on the court, you should be able to bring the energy, bring the enthusiasm, and let's go up tempo, let's go. And that may be the best part of your day, is that two, three, four hours that you're on the court, and it may just turn your day around. Because now, you're, now you've got the energy for doing this. On my programs, we work on energy, effort, and attitude. Those are the three main pillars, because those are the three things that each player can focus on themselves with. If I'm playing a, a player, or if I've got a player that's a nine UTR, and they're playing a player that's an 11 UTR, obviously the 11 UTR player should win. So if the nine player is getting frustrated, because they're losing every point, that's a good chance to work on their energy, effort, and attitude. Okay? If the 11 UTR player is getting frustrated because they're winning every point, well, let's work on their B game, their C game, their D game. Okay? That's how we get better fight. Because sometimes in, in competition, you will play somebody that you are either way under or way over. And like they're saying, again, you've got that baseline. You're going to be in the middle, and you don't want to go too far high, but you also don't want to get too far low. You want to have a good growth mindset and make players have the ability to focus on themselves internally, to bring out their own energy, effort, and attitude. If they can't, 
then we need to have a let's have a sit down discussion with not just with the player. We need to have the, uh, what I call the tennis trinity: the player, the coach, and the parent. And we need to make sure that the parents know what's going on as well. If the parents are involved, the parents don't know what's going on, we're going to have a problem with that. Um, adult players, a little different, because they are the player and they are the parent. Okay, there's a lot of times with adult players, you don't have somebody else putting the bill, they're putting the bill for themselves. So that conversation is a little bit easier to have with the adult player because they're actually on the board for the entire time while they're, while they're playing. You know, in junior tennis, you may have a player dropped off and the player doesn't see them for two hours. They have no idea what's going on. The player leaves, jumps in the car. You don't even see the parent for two or three weeks. You know, it's all time for them to pay again. So it's, it's really important that we have a very good, in junior tennis, a parent-coach relationship. And we can talk freely and openly about what's going on with the player. But let's call a spade a spade. If, if, if little Johnny, it's always Johnny. But if little Johnny is acting up on the court, Let's have a very good discussion about his behavior on the court and how that's unacceptable and how it could cost him points if you're being voted. Um, anyone have any other questions? Anything? All right. Mike, I think I'm at my, my time here. So guys, thank you very much. It was like, it was like, I've lived in Indiana for 28 years, and it is a, an honest pleasure to come back up here and present and talk to, to all of you. So guys, thank you very much.